Hey everybody, if you've ever wondered how to not suck at music, you have come to the right place. So our first submission comes from Juan Pablo Guitaro and his version of Jingle Bells. Let's check that out. man after my own heart. Jingle bells with way too many chords and none of them particularly functional. There's a lot of jazz in this arrangement. Jazz. 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 I think you did a really great job of getting this like reharmonizer aesthetic down, but there are a few things that I think you can improve upon. Now, the first thing I think you could move away from is this descending bass line in half steps. And I know why you did it. Uh, it's a really useful tool whenever you're working with a non-functional harmony to have this sort of chromatic bass line. It connects chords that otherwise wouldn't have anything to do with one another. None of these chords point to any particular key. It's just being held together by the melody, which is very diatonic and tonal. So you have the very non-functional chords and the very functional melody. But when you set up the expectation of this chromatic bass line descending by half step over and over, it loses the ambiguity that you're probably trying to get with that kind of non-functional chord progression. So, my advice for you is to experiment with different sorts of root progressions. Maybe your bass line moves by thirds or fourths. Anything other than that chromatic half step will at least give a little bit more ambiguity and a little bit more shape to the chord progression. The other thing that you might want to change is your harmonic rhythm, which is the speed at which chords change. And for the most part in this arrangement, you have a harmonic rhythm of a quarter note. I know it changes to a half note in the bridge, but for the most part, it's just a quarter note. That does give the whole thing kind of a chorale vibe, almost like a study vibe, something that you're just kind of doing to see if you couldn't harmonize the melody with just quarter notes, but if you're trying to flesh this out into a full musical statement, maybe try changing the harmonic rhythm a little bit. I put together this little arrangement just to show you some of the ideas that I'm talking about here. So thank you for your submission. Let's check out the next one, which comes from a guy by the name of uh, Samuka. So let's check him out. Okay, pause, I'm gonna let you finish, but I do wanna mention that you started your solo out with something that I call a non sequitur. A non sequitur is of course a consequent phrase which does not match its antecedent phrase, which is a very fancy way of saying you played a lick and then the lick that came after that one did not match the first one. See, whenever I'm improvising and whenever I'm teaching other people how to improvise, I'm always thinking about the concept known as call and response. I'm stringing together phrases in a sort of binary fashion. There's always going to be a call, an antecedent phrase, and a response, a consequent phrase. There always has to be kind of a musical logic to this relationship. So that way your solo kind of makes grammatical sense. One sentence has to flow naturally into the next, the same way that one musical phrase has to flow naturally into to the next. And you are kind of like singing along with your solo, vocalizing, which is fantastic. That's a way that you can really internalize what it is that you're doing, but it doesn't sound like you've made it to that step yet. Take the guitar away and focus on that first riff and sing your solo first. Don't let your fingers guide your phrasing at first. Let your voice guide your phrasing. It will simplify everything a lot because you physically can't do as much with your voice as you can on the guitar. However, in this case, that's a good thing because you will really focus in on the fundamental nature of antecedent and consequence or call and response. Let's listen to a little bit more. Okay. 
Okay, so it sounds like you have some blues licks that you're borrowing from and some jazz licks. You got some fourth sorts of things happening. That's great. But I really think that you should investigate your tone next. Whenever I hear a guitarist play those bends and like the bluesy sorts of inflections that you're using, but with thin gauge strings, I always think, man, this would just sound and feel so much better with thicker gauge strings. I want to hear a little bit of the resistance of the guitar and the tone. Now, of course, that's my personal opinion, and tone is incredibly subjective, but it just doesn't sound like you've approached tone with the same degree of rigor as you have, like, studying jazz scales. Anyway, I've said all this stuff before, but I really do think that tone and phrasing are extremely important, and sometimes neglected. And I'm not saying that you're neglecting them, I just think that those are the things that you should really focus on. So thank you for your submission, and let's check out the next one, which comes from Hayden H., who sent a uh, instrumental metal piece, and they want to know if the score looks professional, and if there are any rules or guidelines that I may have failed to adhere when writing this piece? Let's find out. Okay, it sounds pretty good so far. There is one thing that I would probably change, and that's the voicing that you used for the piano on the E flat 11 chord. Now, I understand why you wrote it like this, because what you did is you probably stacked thirds up from a root. You did it with the first chord, which is an F minor 11 chord in the piano, and that sounds great. And whenever you're stacking thirds in diatonic harmony, most of the time it gets a richer and warmer and, dare I say, jazzier sound. Jazz. 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 However, in the case of an E flat 11 chord, there are some pretty nasty the intervals that arise when you take a look at the inner voices. For example, the G on the bottom and the A flat on the very top create a very nasty minor ninth interval. Now, yes, the guitar voicing does have that A flat on top and the G below with that E flat sus4 over G voicing that you have in the second measure there. But for me, that A flat is a little bit more of a passing tone. The G in the soprano voice of the E flat over G chord moves up to the A flat in the soprano voice of the E flat sus4 over G chord, and then finally resolves back down to the G in the final E flat over G chord. So there's tension and release. In the piano voicing, that A flat on top just has tension. You can kind of mitigate these factors by moving notes in those piano voicings around, so they're not just stacked thirds, you can have more nuanced voicings. Check this out. Jazz. 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 And you know, at the end of the day, if you like the E flat 11 chord, you like the E flat 11 chord. Just take what I'm saying with a little bit of a grain of salt. It's just my personal opinion. My opinion is informed by common practice and why people might not use the E flat 11 that often, but at the same time, if you really hear that in your head, go for it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's keep listening. Okay, I mean, yeah, I really like this. This is really awesome. I, I think that you should get this recorded with real instruments. I really don't think that the Sibelius playback does this musical idea justice. I mean, I think there are a couple things that you can change, at least with how it's notated. For the most part, it's really beautifully written. However, I do think that you don't need to change key signatures whenever you're shifting to that E major chord. It's a really nice color shift, but whenever you're reading something like this, it's just a lot easier to read everything in one key signature with accidentals. This is especially true when you're shifting between 
doing F minor and then E major, F minor, E major, F minor, E major. It's just a lot easier to keep it in one place when you're reading it. Another thing is that piano break before measure 57 probably won't come out very cleanly. The best way to get this sort of effect of getting that really, really fast 30 second note sort of thing is come up with an arpeggiated sequence between the two hands. So basically one hand plays something in one position and then the next hand plays the next thing. So it's Another thing that you might want to experiment with is changing how the lead guitars are harmonized with one another. Because right now they're in thirds, which is great for that sort of epic feeling, but you could also experiment with sixths, which are just thirds but in inversion, but they still have a sort of epic feeling that you get when you have, you know, guitar mini in thirds, which is great. Anyway, these are just some ideas. It seems like you have a pretty solid idea of what you want this piece to be. And you know, I'm sorry I can't go more in depth on it, but this format is not really conducive for a really strong, solid, musical analysis of everything about one particular piece of music. And, you know, when people submit me things, they'll submit things which are like 10 or 15 minutes long. I can't do that, guys. Send me something really short, something that I can analyze in just, you know, a couple minutes. And uh, yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll, be, we'll be gravy if that happens. Anyway, let's check out the next submission. Danielle O'Hallisey. All right, let's check out Danielle's composition piece thing. <laughs> So I like the idea of this piece of music, which is to have like a synth guitar play with like this contemporary classical ensemble and play this sort of modern classical music, but it really kind of misses the mark in practice for me. And I think it misses the mark for a similar reason to an earlier submission and and that it's like, I feel like you haven't really thought through your tone all that much. That insanely aggressive resonance on that synth really doesn't blend at all with the other instruments and it kind of just sort of sounds like a bunch of squishing sounds, like Now, I do know what you're going for, kind of, with this like envelope filter synth sound, but I think you really need to work on it to make it blend better. I think you could turn down the resonance, I also think you could turn down the cutoff, so you're actually more focused in the mid-range instead of getting all of this brittle high end in the sound. Beyond that, I think the performance itself could be a lot more dynamic, basically getting a lot louder and a lot quieter with the music, because the music is great, and I, I really enjoy how it's written, but I think there could be a little bit more dynamic range to the actual performance of it. Anyway, I do appreciate the like experience experimental nature of it. I, I really don't mean to be too harsh with my like critique of the tone. So I'm just giving my opinions unfiltered. So I do apologize about that. But thank you so much for your submission. And uh, let's check out the next one. Okay, so this submission is from Ivo Unrain. He's been playing bass for a year and a half and he's playing Teen Town by Jaco Pastorius. Let's check that out. <laughs> So I'm fairly ambivalent about this because I do like the fact that you're playing a Jaco Pastorius tune, Teen Town, a very difficult piece of music and really challenging yourself when you've only been playing for a short amount of time. It's always great to really reach for the stars. However, your technique is not quite there yet. You know, when anybody tries to do something that's a little bit outside of their ability, there's this natural tendency for the body to want to tense up, which is really unfortunate because that's exactly the opposite of what should be happening. We should be relaxing into the activity and relaxing into the motion. But right here in this particular video, your left hand looks very tenacious. Your fingers are moving more than is absolutely necessary. And I kind of feel the tension just by looking at your left hand. So I want you to play Teen Town, not at the tempo that you attempted it at in this performance, but I want you to play Teen Town at like 
20 beats per minute. Maybe not like that slow, but like 40 beats per minute. Let's say 40 beats per minute. I want you to really master Teen Town, really feel comfortable with Teen Town at 40 beats per minute. And don't even try speeding it up. I know there's gonna be a lot of temptation to try and play it faster because you'll feel more and more confident with it, but really master it at 40 beats per minute. I want you to get rid of that tension, man, because that tension can really cause some stumbling blocks later and you might actually hurt yourself. So keep that in mind. Uh, great job with this uh, Teen Town attempt and thank you so much for that submission. And you know, thank you for everybody who has submitted. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody in this one. I had about 400 submissions for this month's How to Not Suck at Music. So I apologize if I didn't get to all of them. I'm only selecting ones which I feel like can meaningfully comment on. So thank you to everybody who submitted and uh, yeah. Until next time. Peace.